Well, amen. Good to see you today. The last uh, Sunday of the year. What a great time to be in church. Only Probably the only better time would be the first Sunday of the year. Amen. To be started off good, but you know, I want to be ending well as well as starting well. And so it's great to have you here today. And uh, we are missing some folks we're praying for that uh, dealing with a lot of a lot of sickness and uh, and struggles so we we continue to pray for them and we're we're glad to be here well I'm going to attempt a, a, a challenge today I'm going to preach preach all the way through the book of Ecclesiastes in one sermon and uh, you could take a long time through Ecclesiastes but I think it would be it could be fairly depressing I've entitled this uh, there's some great things there and we're going to look at we're going to pull out some of those today um, we're going to walk through it first and uh, not read the whole chapters 12 chapters and then I'm going to boil it down to, to seven points but I want to point out a few things that comes from um, that comes from Ecclesiastes I've entitled this vanity uh, vanity, vexation, or victory. Vanity, vexation, or victory. I was just going to leave vexation out, but I think really that the, the meaning of that word is is kind of the heart of the, 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 the weak side of the heart of this passage, which means a longing for. And I just don't want to live in life. There's a, there's a way to desire things from God, but there's also a, this, this book tells some some tremendous things but it also kind of has a um, a tone of you know uh, eat drink work and die you know and it's just this is and then he's really consumed with the idea that nobody's going to remember me when I'm gone and uh, in fact in one place he says there was a there was a poor wise man and he saved the city but nobody remembered him <laughs> And it's just a sad story, you know. I mean, a, a poor wise man that had had such an impact, but yet nobody remembered him. And it seems like um, uh, the uh, that Solomon is consumed with concerned about this 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 uh, grasping for life. And all through this, he says, "I, you know, I got what I wanted. I I took what I I, I could. I uh, I had I built houses." I built uh, uh, gardens. I built cisterns to feed the, the plants and, the, and the, the, uh, the trees that I planted. And, and he's just all the time grasping. And I would hope that as we read this today that you don't fall into that category of vexation. And uh, just think about living one's life and saying, I'm just always grasping and I'm never satisfied. And the, God, and the Word of God teaches us to be content. Godliness with content is great gain and so this is primarily in the physical realm and uh, and, and we cannot we work for things we have things and folks by the way even if you're struggling to have uh, all that you need we probably have more than most of this world will ever even be able to think about having okay we have vehicles we have air conditioning we have clothes we have more than one change of clothes we have more than one pair of shoes uh, we have shoes uh, we have so much that we surely should not fall into possibly some of Solomon Solomon said he, he even says in here and I still have my wisdom I have this thing that God gave him he gave him wisdom and and but yet he because he didn't ask for things he gave him wisdom but yet in this book Book, it seems the vexation that he uses is a longing a grasping for things that just more things and and it's like he's got a foot in the world and a foot for God and so we're going to just kind of buzz through this book and then I'm going to boil it down to some points uh, some of these are repetitious so um, he starts out, he says, The word of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Let's pray. Father, I do pray now that as we look into your word, that it will, would help us to encourage us to not follow the path of, of just get, uh, grasping for things. And yet it seems like that is, uh, that is the, the day. That is the day we're in. And we are, we, 
we have been taught that it's great to have the things we have and it's great to have the very nice things that we have but father i pray that we if we're going to grasp for something i pray that we'd grasp to know you we would grasp to please you we would grasp to have more of an understanding of you and your ways and we all need that but father i pray that you'd use this time as we finish up this year it's great to be in your house lord bless those that are here bless those that will watch this later and be with them wherever they are with their needs needs and some of our dear folks of the past we love them and we miss them and lord we ask you to use this with god's blessing in jesus name we pray amen so we see the tone as we as we start out there and then uh and then go to uh go to chapter go to chapter two and uh and then you see i said in my heart go go to now and i will prove thee with myrrh therefore enjoy pleasure and behold this also is vanity so now uh, uh i said of laughter it is mad and of mirth uh what doth it i sought in my heart to give myself unto wine yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom and to lay hold on folly till i might see what was that good for the sons of men for that good what was good what was that good which they should do under the heavens all the days of their life so he is uh and then he goes into i made great works i builded my houses i planted my vineyards and so we're not going to spend a lot of time there um and so we 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 move on down uh to chat go, go jump over to chapter four he says, uh, so I return in verse one and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun and behold the tears of such as were oppressed and they had no comforter and on the side of their oppressors there was power but they had no comforter and so i can see why he's why he's discouraged there and we uh we will mention that a, a little bit um, a little bit later in uh, in chapter 4 in verse in verse 9 he says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor for if they fall the one will lift up the fellow but woe to him that is alone when he falleth for he hath not another to help him we'll say a little bit more about that in one of the points but we see that isolation is the enemy's tactic isolation is the enemy's tactic and he's always trying to isolate uh christians in the in the animal world the uh the, the they're trying to isolate the prey they're trying to isolate the attack so that they can uh, go in for the kill and and so satan is always working for an isolation at attack and so whenever you feel like i'm gonna back away you're listening to the wrong you're listening to the wrong spirit you're listening to the wrong voice and we will address that um in 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 a little bit go to chapter go to chapter five uh, verse 1 keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools for they consider not that they do evil we talked about this morning we were talking about different types of sin in Sunday school and one of the sins that we are to be aware of is the sin of the mouth the sin of words a multitude of words and we have to guard that and that's why I always ask you to pray for your pastor and for preachers because we have to use words and we sometimes offend not meaning to and so we have to use a lot of words so it's wise not to do that so i guess you could say pastor you'd be wiser if you had shorter sermons that might be a application to that and then in chapter seven 
uh, this is a passage probably when I when I think of, of of Ecclesiastes I preach out of seven a lot over the years at funerals and it says a good name is better than precious ointment and the death the day of death than the day of birth so a good name is better than precious ointment and the death is saying is better than the day of birth now normally that's not true but he goes on to tell why that actually a death is better than a birth and I will I will get to that in just in just a minute um, but a good name a good name is uh, is truly truly priceless um, if we uh, if we jump, let's see, there's just some little things that I wanted to point out uh, along the way here because we won't be able to, um, we won't be able to get all of these. Um, the, um, I'm going to hit several of these, so I just, I'm just looking for a couple that I wanted to point out. Um, The uh, chapter 7 and verse 10, it says, Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. And we've heard that in our life. These are just some of the thoughts I wanted to pull out here that are really not preaching on. And that is, uh, they would say, well, I like the good old days. You know, I liked it in the past. I liked, uh, uh, I liked it when things were different. And he's saying here, that's not true. And really, it's not true. You don't really want to go back and you don't really want to do without some of the things that we have. And we have, we have great advantages, a washing machine, an, an automobile, uh, things that we have, uh, dishwashers, uh, uh, highways that are, uh, that are nice. All you got to do is to go to, go to uh, Mexico or go to, go to Africa and realize uh, how nice it is to have good roads. Uh, maybe we're learning that with our peak road right now that they have forsaken us and they, uh, you know, I drive on the left side of the road just like they do in Africa because that's the only good side. If I'm going that way and uh, tell somebody's coming then I get on the other side but they will fix it eventually and that'll be nice but there's some places that that would be a good road and there's big potholes and there's uh, because they don't have good law enforcement they'll just put a speed bump on a highway and you have to know where they are because if you hit a speed bump going the speed limit it'll tear your car up or as in one case if one of the children's not buckled in good then he'll get launched into the you know to the roof and have to go get stitches and that's happened that's happened before too and uh, you have to make sure those seat belts are secure everybody was seat belted but it wasn't secure and so uh, just a difficult place the roads are terrible we we were going down one of the legal roads when we were there and we literally bent the bumper the back bumper up on a troop carrier because the it was so rough going down to a to a gully and we hit in the bumper drug and bent it up and so we have here uh, very good roads. We have automobiles. We have so many things. We don't want to go back to the days where people got stuck in the ruts of the roads. And there was only one car that would pass. If you had to get off, it was dangerous. So, so he's saying, no, no, you really don't want to go back. And we have so many other advantages. We have travel and air. We have uh, uh, our phones, our computers. So many, so many, uh, so many good things things that we have. So as we, um, we look, uh, we look down through this, this book, many, uh, He's, he's talking about over and over, he says, but oh, vanity, vanity, vexation of spirit. And just we're just going to eat and we're going to drink and then, you know, and, and we're going to, we're going to work, we're going to labor, and that's all there is to life. So, but in the midst of that, there's some things that I would like to, I would like to point out today that would be a message for us. And I trust would be a blessing as you read this book. It's not something you read a lot unless you're reading through scripture. But the first thing is, 
that uh, God, God is in the timing of life. God is in the timing of life. Go back to chapter 3. And it says, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones. A time to gather stones together. A time to embrace. A time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. What profit has he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? And so he keeps going back to that idea. But verse 11 says, He hath made everything beautiful in his time. And so the first thought I want us to take as we end up the year is that God is in the timing of things. We have a tremendous God of order. We have a God of time. He is a timeless God, but he uses time for his glory. And so it is, it is, it, it, there are several applications to this. And that is what I notice as I am getting older, that I notice people that are getting older, many times they are, they are troubled about that time. They're troubled about getting older. They're troubled about the struggles that come with it. But if you're really, really old, the only alternative is that you're not here anymore. So be grateful that you're, as some say, on this side. Amen? And so, so there's so much to be grateful for. There are things that you can teach because of your age. There are things, people that you can help. There's wisdom that you have. There is, uh, and yet there's still opportunity. I shared this morning morning that that my son as we, as we talk of the end of his day and the beginning of our day uh, in the mornings he he um, we talked last night the beginning of his Sunday and we talked a while ago the end of his the beginning of ours and he said I sent you a book and I've got one ordered it's out of print but they've reprinted it and um, uh, it's it's by F.B. Myers and it's on how to memorize the Bible the whole Bible and I'm going, you really are, you really are pushing me, son. You're really pushing me, okay? But you see, memory work is good when you get older because it keeps the mind alive, you see? And so maybe that's what he's thinking. I don't know. But scripture memory is a very good thing. But see, it's, it's, a, it's something I can still do. It's something I can work on. It's something, there's new challenges. I'm not done all that I'm going to do. I'm not finished yet. I still need to learn a lot. I still have to, to knock and seek and find and and. And so even in those old ages, don't get to the point where, where well, it's harder now and, and, and it's hard to just even take a step for some people. But listen, just keep stepping. I encouraged my father-in-law. He, he, I, said, I said, Pop, you've got to get into therapy and, and you've got to keep working. And I said, a mile today means two miles tomorrow. It means you, and I said, I'm not literally talking about a mile, but do, keep doing things now so you can do more tomorrow. But folks, God works in time. Do you know that the, the miracle, some of God's miracles are in the timing uh, more so than even in the doing. And so when God works in his timings, it's amazing to me. I love it. I love to see it. I love to say, oh, well, I don't ever go to that store, but I'm going to go in that store. And I go in this, uh, maybe a different Walmart than I normally go into. And I walk in, walk in through the Walmart and I pass someone that I had, had diligently witnessed to over the years. And they're, they've, they've changed their job. They're out of where I, uh, there was a one man I used to go to about uh, small engine stuff. And, and so he's, uh, he's in a different job now altogether but uh, I go to a different store and I'm walking through it and I pass him and I get to talk about the Lord 
And that's a timing thing. God makes everything beautiful in his time. And God uses special times, but God wants to use the time that you're in right now. And be careful, be very careful. Kind of what Solomon did, even in his wisdom, he's complaining, but yet he reminds, he reminds us, because it's inspired, that God works in, in all good, in all times. And yes, as, as things change and as jobs change and as finances change, it might be more difficult, but it doesn't mean it's not a good time. And it doesn't mean that God is not there. And so that's what he's saying. God makes everything beautiful in his time. So don't get ahead of God by pushing to do something out of God's will because uh, you, uh, you're in a hurry. Just remember, God works. God is, is working in time. The second thing is that man sees the work and labor and death because, and sometimes they just focus on that. Don't get caught, don't get caught in, that, in that trap. Do not, uh, do not come to the place where you feel like you're alone and it's just, it's just a drudgery. Uh, look what he said in chapter 4. We read it a while ago, but he said, So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of such as were oppressed. And, you know, David talks about that in the Psalms. And they had no, they had no comforter. They had no comforter. And uh, back in... Um, uh, chapter 2 and verse 22 it says for what hath man of all his labor and of the vexation of his heart wherein he hath labored under the sun for all his days are sorrows and his travail grief yea his heart taketh not rest in the night this is also vanity and this is a picture of someone that's not trusting God. It's a person that's working hard, but they're not trusting God in their work. They're not doing all things for the glory of God. They're not getting a joy out of their work. God can bring into our work uh, testimony and blessing and witness opportunities. And so if you're, if you're working hard, you know, God can change work. God can change direction. God can change places and positions and you get counsel and you get training and you can change change things but don't complain don't don't just be found complaining and being like this saying oh vexation of spirit vexation of heart a longing of my heart for something I don't have or something I'm not doing listen get going get after it get some get some training get 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 another plan get uh, uh, with counsel go go towards it but but don't don't feel like you're alone because when we when we, go, when we go to the New Testament for the believer today, in this you might see a pre-Holy Spirit communion uh, lifestyle that sometimes was, was distant from God. Go to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And uh, we're going to be reminded of something that is wonderful. In verse 16 it says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Look at verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And then um, in chapter 15, in verse 26, over a page, he says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. 
And ye also shall bear witness because ye have been with me from the beginning. They loved, they, can you imagine uh, hanging around with Jesus Christ? I mean, just seeing God in the flesh and seeing those miracles and hearing his words. And, and I know they messed up at times and I know they, they misunderstood at times, but they were, they were comforted by him. And, and he said, but I'm going to send another comforter. And he said, in fact, if I don't go away, the comforter can't come. And I'm going to go to heaven, but, you're, but, the, but, the, but the spirit of truth, the comforter is going to come. And he's going to lead you, and he's going to be with you, and he's going to comfort you. I'll never forget as we we'd, had, had come to Houston to start the church, that um, while Jody was graduating that last year, um, a little water on my glasses. How did I do that? Um, they, uh, she said, Pastor, uh, I had a secretary there in the college where I was teaching the labs. And she was the secretary of all the teachers and uh, the major biology teachers as well as me, the lab teacher. And I'd get things copied and so forth. She would help me. She said, you're going back to Houston area. She said, my, my, my granddad has got cancer. And it's really bad. And he's old. He's really bad. And he said, my dad, my stepdad uh, is, is lost. Would you go? Would you go and witness to them? So we started witness. We met them and we Jody would fix banana nut bread. and We'd take over there and and they were kind of distant and watching us, you know. And then I remember the the granddad was really too old to be driving, but he was driving and he he crashed the car into into a, a, a classic car. You know, it was a it was a GTO. And uh, and and so I had a friend that was in the church where I was there that was very good with body work. And and so um, we bought a fender. And uh, we and the guy said, "Look, I'm getting my whole car painted." He said, "If you just put the fender on there, primed gray, it'll be okay because I'm gonna I'm gonna get it uh, painted all up, and, it, and you don't have to worry about it being painted." And so we put the fender on it for him, and they're going, "Why? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this?" And he said, "Well, we just, we just, you know, that's just the way we are. We're just trying to be a blessing to you guys." And we talked to him a little bit about the Lord and. And I remember the, the stepdad, he was a bartender, and he called me one day and he said, uh, he said, I need to talk to you. He said, I grew up religion, religious, but God was at the church. He said, your God is with you in the night. And he said, would you come over here and tell me about your God that's always with you? And when I was taught my God, I had to go down to the church and uh, because he's somehow dwelling in that place. And, uh, and so we got to go over there, and he came to Christ that day. And, and you know, um, and the dad, and the granddad, uh, he was in the hospital. And, uh, and I was up there talking to him about the gospel, going, going through the gospel with him. And he was about to go into, uh, he, was, he was having an x-ray. They brought the x-ray to his room. And I said, I said excuse me, sir, I, I don't want to be rude, but I said, could y'all wait? I said, this man is, 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 is talking about eternal things. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And they just backed the machine out. And, 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 and he came to Christ. And it was such a blessing to just come and minister to that family. But he said, you've got a God that's there in the night. And that's what he's talking about here. I'm going to send a comforter. Uh, you see, I think, why, I think uh, Solomon had all this wisdom, but he didn't have the comforter. And I mean, he had faith of what was to come, but he didn't have the comforter. And we have the Holy Spirit. You can't get away from him. You can't, you can't, go, you can't go away from God's Holy Spirit. He's with you. And, and young people grow up, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go up and get out of here. I'm going to go do something. Listen, the Holy Spirit's there. Amen. He's already there before you get there. And so we have a comforter and we have a help. But man just sees labor, uh, work, and death. And God says, I am your comforter. 
I'm going to go with that struggle with you. You see, you have to labor because of Adam's sin. There'll be a curse upon man, and he'll have to work by the sweat of his brow. And we have to keep working. We can't just walk over and pull off the, uh, what we need to eat from the trees of the garden. We were put out of the garden. We were put out of paradise because of sin. And sin is upon us all. But if we have a Savior, we have a Redeemer, don't, don't be caught up in what the world sees. See, that's, just a, that's what the world sees. All I, all I do is I, I work, I work to pay the bills, to go to work, to pay the bills, to go to work, to pay the bills, and one day I'm going to die. And that's all they have. But for the Christian, we have the Holy Spirit. We have the Comforter that comes to us when no one else knows what to say. And He comforts our heart. And He teaches us what we need to know. Wow, I wouldn't trade that, amen? I don't think I'd trade that for all of Solomon's gardens and all of his buildings and all of his animals and all of his wives. Don't think I want that problem. I have the Holy Spirit. I have the Comforter. Well, the third thing that we, that we look, out here, look at is, in chapter, is, is back in chapter 4, and we mentioned that briefly. And it says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up the fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him. And then down to verse 11, it says, uh, well, 2 is talking about heat. You know, if, they're, if it's very cold, they have heat, they have benefit uh, in verse 11. But number 12 says, and if one prevail against him, two shall with, withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. A threefold cord. And that, that could be carried out. Uh, uh, we've used that in a wedding before. That you have, you have one that's alone, but now you have two. But if they have Christ in their life, it's a threefold cord and it's not easily broken. And so you want to really make sure that person is really dedicated to the Lord and has evidence of their walk with the Lord uh, because... Uh, People can put on a front, but it's like dating. Dating, we can put on their best, they can put on their best duds. They can put on their best conduct. But if you're, if you're, uh, if you're going through a little different process, you're talking to counselors, you're talking to parents, you're finding out where their strengths are. Maybe you ought to wait a little while. Maybe they should get, a, maybe they should get some more education. Maybe they should have some more time. Um, and whatever the needs would be, but it's more of an honest approach, and you're not surprised. But... Um, The key thing is for young people to know, does that person love God? Is there evidence of that person a track record? Uh, this week is really sweet. I was, I was uh, over here working in the church, and, uh, and I hear this crowd. There's a crowd in the lobby, you know, and I go over there, and it's uh, Pastor Rudy. And Pastor Rudy's got this big family with nine I like they were all grown. I mean, they were all like big. They weren't like, dee, 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 dee. you know, they were they were like nine teenagers, you know, or young adults in this family. And uh, and so uh, I got the story. They were showing him the building and after the flood and the repairs. And and he was telling them. And I said, well, what you know, they're from Georgia and there's a uh, an interest in one of uh, Brother Rudy's daughters and so forth. And and so uh, I got to meet the guy and they said, well, they've known him a year. And I said, Oh, you only have six more years to work for that, for that hand, you know. And you should have seen his face. They all started laughing and said, look at his face. You know, his, his countenance just dropped, you know. And, uh, and so anyway, we, we had a good time with him. And uh, he said, we thought if anything were to move forward, we need the families needed to meet. And see, because see, young people, you marry a family. And so the families were getting to know each other over the holidays, and they were just looking at the future uh, and according concept and so forth. It was great. But this, the enemy wants us to be isolated. But there's another place where the, where the three are, is really important. The scripture says that if two or three together in my name, 
they're in the they're in my in the midst. I was reading a book last night. I actually I said in Sunday school I was reading it to John. It's like a dad reading to his son. You know, he's a grown son. But I'm reading these stories out of this. You know. 70, 80, 90 year old book, you know, about about prayer and the power of prayer and and the teaching there of sin and the need of Christ and the need of prayer. And he was saying people don't they don't get it. They don't get the power that's in the church. He said, if two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And so you wonder what, why the, there's attack. There's attack on the family. See, he's saying right here, it went two, they come together, and three, and, and there's strength in, 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 in not being isolated. But yet the enemy, the enemy will tell you, uh, uh, you know, you just, 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 just leave, or just go away, or just be out there by yourself. Well, let me tell you, he put even within the, the nature of animals to know better than that. We got, to, we got to see, when we went to Alaska to see uh, a former family there, uh, the Fowlers, we went to go see the Muskoxen. And, and they're not native for that area, but they had been brought in and there was a mus muskoxen farm and, and we got to see them and they're, they're, they're amazing. They're, they're, they have this woolly mammoth look when all their, their, high, their, their hair, they got different kinds of hair that keeps them warm and they work that out and it's very expensive. I mean, like a little scarf, you know, or a little tie is like three or $400. You know, it's just very expensive stuff. But boy, when those those guys have got horns and, and, and big old head, you know, and they got these little defenseless babies, but they'll get the babies in, if the wolves come around them. They'll get them in a circle. They'll get them inside the circle, and they'll all be be head and horns out. If you can picture them, just lined up in a circle with the the business in out. And whenever uh, whenever the enemy comes in to try to to get one of those little calves for supper, then they just attack them and they just smash them in the ground. And then and then they pull back into rank. And then another one will fire out and pass, smash him in the ground. And finally, they say, "This is just too tough." They're in a group. They're protecting each other. They're protecting the weak. But the devil will take people in a church and he'll try to cause division and he'll try to cause problems and he'll, and he'll tell a person, an individual, oh, well, you're not important and you just need to stay out here by yourself. You don't need to be there tonight. You don't need to be there for this, this or that activity. You just go ahead and just stay out there by yourself. Then you're choosing to be vulnerable and miss the concept of the strength that comes in God's plan here that he shows us in two or three and then he starts the church and he says I'm going to start this amazing miraculous supernatural entity called the church and my Holy Spirit will be in it and in you and you will work together and the and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Listen, whenever you feel isolated and to pull apart and to pull back, you're listening to the wrong spirit because God has got an amazing, amazing testimony that's yet to be seen by the church that will pull together like that and say, you just try to get our little ones. You just try to get our children. You just try to get our, our weak ones. We're coming after you. We'll smash you. We'll pray. We'll, we'll fight you. We'll stand up. God is greater than the enemy of this world. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. But listen, don't listen to him and go out there on your own. And so many young people get up and say, I, I'm just going to leave, go out there. I'm just going to go try the world. And they get away from that protection. And it's a dangerous place. Isolation is the enemy's tactic. The fourth thing is be careful. Chapter 5, be careful about your walk. Look at this. He says, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. You know, that could even be in the songs. Uh, All to Jesus I surrender. That could be a sacrifice of a fool. I know I've, I've heard of churches that preach first and sing second because they want their heart to be right before they sing and make a sacrifice of a fool. And they don't want to stand up. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Me pray in public. 
You see, we have to be, we have to see here that we are need to be careful. We need to be careful. Uh, be careful what you talk about. I, I visited a church one time. I mean, I'm just a young preacher looking and listening and learning, and I visited a really big church. It was a it was a holiday thing and it was a program. And I just kind of was making my way and wandering through the people. And it was a, a Christmas time and it was a great pageant and, and it was very, very well done. And and uh, but it was halftime, <laughs> excuse me, it was the intermission. And and, uh, and I was just listening. And I could just see that, I could see and feel, you know, like, who is he? We don't know him. And uh, uh, what stocks are you picking today? And uh, did you hear about, uh, did you hear about, about uh, this or that? And I'm going through the crowd and I'm listening for somebody to say, God is so good. Isn't God good? You know what God did this week? No, they're, they're, all, they're all there in a group talking about the world stuff. And I was just a visitor. But nobody shook my hand. And nobody, nobody came up to me and said, I haven't seen you. Are you, are you new? You know, I like it when I go into churches. And, and uh, I recently went into one, and, you know, and, and I'm a preacher. You know, I'm a preacher. I even look like a preacher. You know, but the, well, it's good to have you. Or is this your first time to visit? And, and you know, I mean, I like that. Because it's a, it's a church that's warm and they're, and they're alive and they're, they're looking for visitors and they're talking and they're, they're, they're reaching out. Be careful. Come to church prepared. And, and this, is, this is a careful walk. Look what he says. Let's go on and read a little more. He says right here in the scripture, he says, To give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that, the, that they do evil. Oh, it could be evil. Be not rash with thy mouth. We talked about that in Sunday school. That's one of the ways we talked about sinning. Rash, we talked about uh, that today. He said, uh, Don't be quick with your mouth, or let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. Now, he is saying, be, have a careful walk. And he says, be ready to hear. Be ready to hear. Verse 1. Have the, have the spirit of a learner. You know, I can learn from everybody. I can, I can, learn, I can learn from my enemy. I can learn from the. I can learn from people out there, uh, you know, in, even in the world. Sometimes, uh, the, the scripture says that they're, you know, they're they're even smarter than we are at times. So there's there's things to learn. I can learn from negative lessons. I can. I want to be be ready to hear what God is going to share with me. Is what God's Spirit is going to teach me. Ready to hear. And not to be quick to give a sacrifice of a fool. Because God is the God of this universe. Verse 2. Verse 3 says, For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. Um, we're going to see that in a little bit later, but uh, they will show himself. A fool will show himself. We will eventually, if we have an area. Now, uh, he says, uh, he talks about the feet here, uh, too. And in verse 6, he talks about the mouth. In verse 4, look at this. It says, when thou vowest a vow unto God, uh, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in a fool. The context of this is also, be, don't be quick to make a vow. You know, we're ending up the year. We're starting the year. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this for God. Be very, be very careful. Make sure that's led of God's Holy Spirit. Because a vow is a very serious thing, lest the works of our hands be destroyed. That's why the vows at a wedding are very important. And he says, be very careful. Uh, verse 6, suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angels that it was an error. Oh, I didn't mean that vow. Wherefore, or I, I didn't mean to say that. Have you, have you ever said that? I've said it. You know, as a young person growing up, and I said something harshly or rashly, and I said, I didn't mean that. 
He, he says right here, don't do that. Or don't say it was just an error. Wherefore, should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the works of thine hands? Pastor, you can count on me. That's, that's a ra that, that you know, make sure you believe that. Amen. And there are people that are able to say that because they do, they do mean it. So we see here a careful, the fourth thing is a careful, a careful walk. And if we had time, Ephesians 5, 2, we need to walk in love. Uh, 1 John, 2 John 1, 6, and this is the love that, that uh, and, and this is love that, ye, that we walk after his commandments. So we're to, we're to be concerned of our walk when we move into the house of God. Next very quickly is a good name and, it, and, and I would just say uh, better than the commercial but I would say it's priceless it's priceless chapter 7 says a good name is better than precious ointment Boy, back then a medicine a, a, med a medication priceless uh, could, say, could say more about that Go, I'm going to keep moving chapter 10 um, chapter 10 <laughs> <laughs> Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. Those, those, those we, as a Christian, we have a testimony. Uh, we have to be careful. That's why it was a, uh, that's why it hit the world kind of hard. Uh, when the assistant pastor bought his wife uh, a Lamborghini or whatever it was, a two hundred thousand dollar car, in that particular case, not as the guy at First Baptist that, that had just stolen eight hundred thousand the the week before, uh, embezzled it for the things he wanted. I'm going. I'm, I'm saying, how can you miss eight hundred thousand dollars? Wow! Uh, but uh, they literally get over a million, a million and a half a week. So you know, that's I guess not as hard to lose almost a million but the the the, the fellow that bought the car uh, there was not supposedly any anything stolen there but it says here um, the reputation for wisdom and honor we we have to uh, a, a little folly is, is a stench and the world the world some of the world were saying now the prosperity group was saying look that they're prospering and we all ought to prosper we all ought to have a Lamborghini and I don't think we should I think that 200,000 would be a lot better on the mission field but that's my opinion that's my opinion, and that's what I see in Scripture. But I'm just saying that it, why was it a newsworthy story? Because even the non-church people said, that's too much. That's not appropriate. But some of them said, well, if you, you, know, if you got it, flaunt it. But you see, there's, there's things in Scripture that would teach us not to be so flamboyant in that respect. And... Uh, this is talking about it that our reputation a wise man's heart is as his right hand but a fool's heart is his left and so we have a good name and then we have a fool and it says yea also when he that is a fool verse 3 walketh by the way his wisdom faileth him and he saith to everyone that he is a fool. Now he's not saying I'm a fool. He's, his, his life is saying that he's a fool. And so be careful, be careful how you walk. And be careful because a, um, you have a good name and it's priceless. Number five and number six, a fool will show themself. And so just be patient just be patient. Time, time will show, and and that's important uh, when you're watching others or when you're trying to figure out your your future. And then the last thing that I'd like to just give you is number seven, and that's in verse chapter twelve. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Young people. I will challenge you, there's, there is a problem here. He doesn't mean to just remember in your youth and try to live your adult life in the, the thoughts of your youth. 
I see that all the time. I see people that never matured in their Christian growth from a child. They heard about David and Goliath. And oh, David killed a giant. God's strong. But they don't understand how to apply that to their life. They hear about crossing Jordan, but they don't understand the application to their life. They understand about the pillar uh, uh, of cloud by day and the, uh, the, cl the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. They don't, they don't understand about God's leading. They know the stories, but they don't know the God of the stories. And then they go into life and boom, 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 the evil days. You got to pay your rent. You got to pay your car payment. You got to pay your insurance. You got to pay for gas. The gas is going up. Uh, you know, whatever's happening going on in uh, the, the, the hell and all of this that's going on, the insurances and the evil days come. It says you remember now your creator in the day of your youth. You get grounded and you focus on your life for God and as you move into those struggles of life, God will be with you. But there is, a, there is a problem there and that is that some people just try to do that on, the, on their Sunday school training. But you've got to turn that, those Sunday school stories into a, a reality living. You've got to prove God in your life in prayer and waiting on God. And as the trials get bigger, you're able to hand him those trials and you're able to trust him with your life. And it's a good life. And it finishes with this. In and, 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 and verse 13, in verse 12, it says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And I close by just saying, remember the mighty creator from your youth to your old age. And that God is in control. And that God is mighty. And that the goal is, it says here in the terms of, of to, to keep his commandments. And, and uh, it is to do the will of God. Whatever choices you face, is it the will of God? And there should be a holy reverence. That's not the will of God. I don't want to do it. I want to do the will of God the best I know how. It's a work in progress. It's a, we're all learners. There's no perfection. But I want, to, I want to follow this mighty God of the universe that has sent a comforter into my heart. And he will lead me from my youth to my old age and to the grave. What a wonderful God we have. Folks, it's not vanity and vexation. It's not, I want more and I don't have what I want. It's that God has been so good. And he sent his son and his savior. And he sent the, the, the Holy Spirit to dwell in me and to help me and to comfort me. And he's, and he's created a thing called a church. And it's worthy of a commitment. It's worthy of joining. It's worthy of being a part. Because he is worthy. That's his plan. If you want the power of God, you got to submit to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your book of Ecclesiastes. It just sits there. It just sits there at the end of Proverbs. All that wisdom just sits, sits there at the end of the Psalms and the Proverbs. And, and Lord, it is, it is sometimes... And the reason it's better, a, 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 birth, a death is better than a birth is because it says it causes the living to, to, to take their life in store. It takes, it takes them to examine their life. And Lord, when we go, sadly go to a funeral, which is the end of this life, but it's the beginning of the next life, if there's joy that they love God, then it does two things. It reminds us to live for God. And if there's not joy, it reminds us, am I right with God? Is Jesus my Savior? Or do I just have a church? Do I have just to have a religion? Do I have a denomination or, 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 or just a, a vague uh, uh, agreement with, with a, a God concept? Or have I 
submitted to the righteousness of God. Am I a child of God and would say, yes, Father? What would thou have me to do as we finish this year and look at next year? Are you, are you going to grow me and teach me and lead me? And Am I going to have a good name? I need your help. Lord, speak to hearts. If there's anyone that's never said yes to Jesus, you said yes to the cross for them, but they need to submit to the righteousness of God. Father, for all of us, you're with us from the grave, from the, from the birth to the grave. And Lord, help us to submit, to fear God and keep your commandments. We ask you to speak to our hearts now and comfort us in our struggles. In Jesus' name.